author Chris Claremont has made a point repeatedly of emphasizing the stakes of our current narrative. Victor Von Doom has been replaced inside of his armor by his old foe, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four, forcing him to play the part of Doctor Doom. This is complicated by the fact that Doctor Doom has created an alliance with four warlords from the Reborn Earth, generally referred to as the Commanders, and he promised them a world to conquer. Meaning, our Earth. Well, the regular Earth, at least. The 616 Marvel Universe Earth. Aided by weapons and an army transported by his flagship, it has been made abundantly clear that war with the forces of the reborn Earth will destroy the world. And opening issue 28, Claremont does it again. Our first six pages of this issue are of a simulation, one that is being run by the Pentagon, the Avengers, Doom's commanders, and Doom himself. Reed sighs as the results present themselves. His twice-over wife, Sue, leans in, reassuring him that he'll find a way to figure this out. Johnny, who leans against a nearby wall, inquires as to how he's spying on all of these groups. Reed explains that, apparently, Doctor Doom has access to the higher echelons of the government, including the Avengers. Reed promises to leak word to Tony Stark so that he can correct it later. Ben enters the scene here, laden with either weapons or technical equipment. It's kind of hard to judge. He's much more pessimistic about their situation, though. They just got covert word, and I'm not sure what that means, but apparently they just got covert word that the U.S. military and S.H.I.E.L.D. are staging troops around New York City. The second that Doom or his commanders do anything suspicious they are going to strike. Similarly, if the United States makes too overt of a move, the commanders might strike. Either action could kick off a war that will end everything. Johnny scoffs, though. They're Doom's commanders, and they happen to have an in with that guy, right? Why doesn't Reed just tell them to GTFO? Ben explains that sure, Reed is pretending to be Doom, so you gotta think. Would Doctor Doom give the order to retreat here? He doesn't think so. Reed agrees with this assessment. The commanders obviously can't have the world that the real Doctor Doom promised them, but he also can't stall them forever. Something is gonna have to give sooner or later. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 12.23, Fantastic Four, volume 3, Honeymoon Blues. You might think that I'd be really annoyed by this opening, repeating the threat of the commanders for a sixth time! But this scene actually benefits from the simulation being detailed to the extreme, and us getting a much more comprehensive play-by-play of the events that would be playing out. We learn that Doom has a weapon called the Hammer of God, described as plasma charges, which are composed of antimatter suspended in a containment field. Upon impact, they create a reaction that is akin to the burst that created the universe, but micro-sized. They destroy their targets utterly, but they leave no radiation to ruin the landscape for the survivors slash winners. In the simulation, Doom's forces hit the White House and Genosha first, and given that Genosha is populated by mutants and ruled by Magneto, it is definitely a target worth hitting. This cripples two of the most powerful governments that could stand against Dr. Doom's armies. Dorma's Atlan forces, which make up the army that we have heard so much about, would then take the world's various navies next. The superheroes would then respond, Doom's forces would inevitably overwhelm them, and I wouldn't say that I buy that idea at all, but it does make a much stronger argument that such an outcome is possible. It's very nice to see it play-by-play style, and it does help to ground the story more, and I like that. I also think it's neat that the United States military and the Avengers are running potential scenarios. 
it doesn't really feel like a thing that the Avengers would do. They are a much more fly by the seat of their pants reactionary kind of group, uh, but the Pentagon would be doing this kind of thing for sure. I also appreciate that Doctor Doom is supposed to be this great technological genius, but he is so often just a beaten foe that it's easy to forget how smart and skilled he's supposed to be. So this is a pretty cool way of reinforcing that, the idea that he has hacked into both the government and the Avengers computer systems. That's really clever, I have to admit it. Ben being the one to explain the tactical situation that they're in is a nice touch as well. While Ben's military background has been established before in this run, it's rarely explored as a matter of plot or character, so I like seeing it at least getting referenced here. There is also a small artistic thing here that I particularly like. When Johnny first appears, leaning against the wall like it seems he always does, he's playing with the fire on one of his hands. Then, as Reed and then Ben explain how dangerous things are, his whole body catches fire, save for his head. Then, finally, his head catches fire until we get to the very end of the scene, where he finishes it by dousing his flames and storming off, quitting both the situation and his flames. That is a great visual way of showing how agitated Johnny was in this scene. That's really good visual shorthand. So Claremont, LaRocca, Fibert, and Liquid have established the issue's main focus— the danger of the commanders, and how precarious the Fantastic Four's situation is. Now, we just need to explore it. Elsewhere on the flagship, the commanders are going about their own business. Divinity feeds on... the souls of some monks? I mean, they seem to be cool with getting killed by this inky goo man, so I... I mean, I guess that's cool. Dorma, on the other hand, addresses her Atlan army, the only commander here to actually have an army. She promises them blood, victory, the death of Baroness Von Doom, and a world that is hers. Okay, nice to see that the marriage that you proposed did its job in satisfying you, Dorma. The other commanders are either shocked or annoyed to hear such a speech from her, but Dorma won't allow good sense to stop her plans. They have a plan to win, and they have the ability to accomplish it. All they're waiting on is word from Doom. If they manage to seize the world without Doom's approval, then surely he will appreciate their initiative, duh. And their first target is going to be Earth's greatest heroes, the Avengers. But three-fourths of the Fantastic Four won't allow that to happen. Ben, Johnny, and Sue enter the room and low-key challenge the commanders. If they think that they can handle the Avengers then surely they can handle three members of the Fantastic Four, right? Dorma charges forward, hungry for this match, but Shakti holds her back. They're clearly trying to bait them into attacking the Baroness, and Doom would certainly not be pleased with such a thing. Dorma breaks free, threatening to disarm Shakti if she touches her again. Then she turns to Sue. If they want to fight, then they'll have it. Suddenly, Ben tells Technarchs to get away from the wall, although I'll admit I'm not exactly sure why. Technarchs replies that it cannot comply with that command. The attack order has already been issued, and it cannot be recalled. In another area of the ship, a bank of computers come to life. Doom and Lancer look at it, seeing weapon systems come to life across it. The main guns are preparing to fire. Doom issues a counter order, but as the cannons charge, we cut to the forces that are manning them. They are Dorma's soldiers, not Doom's, and they will follow no such order from him. Prepare to flooping fire, my dudes. Lancer runs from the bridge to the nearest turret, and, using her energy lances, she slashes it open. It detonates, temporarily knocking her out in the explosion. Doom flies to another turret, shoving the barrel up so that it fires harmlessly into space. The city is saved... But Doom knows that the world now thinks that he has launched this attack, and they will respond. And so they do. The Avengers scramble immediately, hoping to settle this whole matter before things get out of hand. And they do a fairly good job basically keeping the offensive capabilities of the ship focused on them instead of on destroying the city below. Reed, as Doom, begins to shut down the ship's weapons, but this leaves him open to attack. 
Riding in on a flying motorcycle, the Scarlet Witch drops Captain America off, who dives at Doom. Or rather, he tries to, as Lancer leaps up at the last second so that he slams into her instead. We then move back to the Commanders, who continue their fight against the Fantastic Three. The Human Torch and the Invisible Woman team up to defeat Technarchs, then Dorma, and then they run off, wanting to get to Doom and back him up. Lancer has been doing her best to fend off Captain America, but he's just such a skilled fighter. The fact that he is also a good person has kept her from going all out, but she is at the wall here. The only way that she's going to win this fight is if she uses lethal force. But now Doom leaps between her and Captain America, shouting for her to stop. The leap knocks them both over the edge of the ship, and they plunge into the Hudson River below, somehow surviving a fall that would have been stories upon stories tall. Doom pulls Lancer out of the water, and they fly into the air, but they are now surrounded by the Avengers. The camera pulls out again, revealing that the Avengers are surrounded by the Fantastic Four and Doom's army. So then they all talk which takes us into the end of the issue, so let's us talk about what just happened first. This bit with the Commanders isn't really that great. Given that Claremont... Given that Claremont makes a special note of Divinity's powers to possess and then kill its host, I thought for sure that he, and Claremont's narration confirms a gender for this inky fluid of a person, was going to play an important role in this fight. But he doesn't nor do the Fantastic Four battle him or Shakti at all. We only see them fight Technarchs and Dorma, so that's kind of lame and weird. And anyways, Dorma wanting to push forward with the conquest feels right for her character, but it also feels way too soon. She was the one who pitched the marriage as a way of cementing their alliance with the Fantastic Four, but then, the next flooping day, she's talking about killing Sue. It would be one thing uh, if the commanders demonstrated their hologram strategy to Doom, confident that they had built the winning plan, but then he shot them down over some ridiculous small point, something to indicate his reticence towards taking over the world. It is real annoying to me that this issue opens with the commanders being a problem, the commanders triggering the very problem that everyone was scared of, and then the issue is just going to end. The Fantastic Four have no agency in solving this problem, and that is super lame. They are sitting in the passenger seat of their own comic book, and it's just super frustrating. This is exacerbated by the Avengers' attack. Yes, it is a natural response to the threat of Doom, and it is a cool way of demonstrating the offensive and defensive capabilities of the flagship. There are some ideas... There are some ideas in here, like ping-pong balls filled with pepper, meant to irritate the Scarlet Witch so much that she can't concentrate to cast any spells that are smart. That's a pretty clever idea, and I appreciate those finer, more character-specific moments that Claremont gives us. Claremont does do some good character work here, given that he isn't the regular Avengers writer, and the heroes do feel right. But they just occupy so much of the book. Four entire pages of combat, plus the six pages of setup, makes ten pages out of twenty-two that are not focused on the four members of the Fantastic Four or the forward momentum of the book. That sucks. That's a terrible ratio. There's also that bit between Captain America and Lancer that I don't like. Lancer does have enhanced strength and durability on top of her plasma lances. In terms of raw power, sure, she would probably be about equal to Captain America. But Captain America has decades of fighting experience and hours of training with the Avengers. Then add in the long-distance advantages of his shield, and he should really win this fight. From a sheer logistical standpoint, Lancer goes down. Plus, Lancer thinks that she's holding back because Cap is a good man, but this was one of the heroes who abandoned her planet to chaos. In the words of Boy Sets Fire, where's your anger? Where's your fucking rage? Wouldn't it have made much more character sense if she had started this fight holding back, but then got angrier the longer she fought Captain America, and then finally she just went lethal? And then, only when she is poised for the kill would Reed step in, saving both her and Captain America. 
I don't think that Lancer's bitterness and anger should have just gone away, and honestly, it's part of what led her to siding with Doom in the first place. It's the one interesting character trait that she had. She has become way too passive since moving into the Fantastic Four's book, and obviously, that's getting me a little upset. The ways that the three-fourths Fantastic Four defeat Technarchs and Dorma are pretty cool, though. The Human Torch and Invisible Woman team up, in which they capture the plasma from the Human Torch in a force bubble and then use it as a weapon, is pretty smart. So, they capture the plasma, right? And Sue then compresses it down into almost microscopic levels of size. She then shapes the force bubble into a spike, which they then ram into Technarch's chest. When she releases the spike, the pressure has now created a fusion reaction, which creates an electromagnetic pulse inside of Technarchs, frying his circuits and disabling him. Similarly, the Thing has been dancing around Dorma while the Human Torch has used his heat to raise the ambient temperature around her. This pulls the moisture out of the air, and out of her body, hyper-drying her without her really noticing it. Her skin literally turns gray and begins to crack, and then her strength leaves her. Then, the Invisible Woman lays her out with a gorgeous left hook. These two fights took teamwork, intelligence, and trust amongst the people doing it, and I appreciate all of the work that went into them. That is good stuff. Having calmed everyone down enough that war isn't on the horizon anymore, Doom tells Captain America that he can remove the threat of the commanders and the flagship if he'll just trust him long enough to do it. And for some reason, Captain America does trust him. I mean, Doom did leap to his defense against Lancer, but there's there's something more going on there, in Cap's words. Yeah. It's almost like you know the man underneath that armor. As Doom and Lancer return to the flagship, he invests in her the power of his regent and asks her to search the reborn Earth for the real Doctor Doom. His forces will obey her in the meantime, and hopefully they can all have their lives back soon. On the ground, Captain America moves over to Iron Man, shaking his own head. Even he can't believe he's going to go along with this. But, if it keeps the world safe, Iron Man says, then so be it. And anyways, it's only crazy if you're actually dealing with Doctor Doom, and he isn't so sure of that anymore. Iron Man has seen that look on Sue Storm's face before, and she only has it for one man, hinting that he has figured out Reed's situation. I'm not 100% sure why the Fantastic Four can't just tell the Avengers what's going on at this point, but... Okay, clearly they're on to them anyways. Doom then sentences his commanders into the care of the Avengers, who will see them all contained. He and Lancer then shake hands as partners, who have come to respect one another. Lancer can see the similarities between Reed and Doom. There's an... there's an honor there. Reed accepts this backhanded compliment, which, coming from Lancer, is genuine, but still, similar to Dr. Doom? That hurts a little bit. But she leaves, unsure about whether or not Reed knows that she is connected to that armor, at least to some degree. Lancer can sense things about the person who is wearing it, a feat that we saw demonstrated in Heroes Reborn Ashima, but she hopes that the changes that she feels in Reed are wrong. That's a story detail that I had actually completely forgotten, that there's some level of mental connection between Doom's armor and Lancer. So it is nice to see it referenced, and it foreshadows some of our upcoming issues as well, but then it makes me question Lancer's role in this story so far. Because she would have known that Von Doom wasn't in that armor from the jump. And that's a big deal, because maybe that's why she was so suspicious of him to begin with. Maybe that is why she stayed in that room when he asked to be alone in issue 26, but that also doesn't feel like Lancer. I could see her waiting until Doom asked everyone to leave him alone, but if this was Victor Von Doom, she just would have told him no. She would have argued that she needed to talk to him, or that she had concerns or questions that something was wrong. Remember, she straight up argued with him two or three times about being his partner, not a pawn, during the Heroes Reborn event books, and I can't see her backing down here. 
you could probably make an argument that not making a scene is the smarter play, but Samantha's personality has never been about making the subtle move. It's always been about facing her problems head on, and the consequences be damned. This is a woman who dove into Atlan-infested waters to save a burning Doctor Doom who fell from the sky and gave her final breath to save him! She's bold, she's fearless, she's confrontational. Screw this creeping around nonsense! I actually think that having Lancer call out Reed on his pretending first would have been smarter, actually, rather than attacking him at all. Then Valeria could have popped out and been like, I knew it! And then they could have gone on from there. That, I think that would have worked way better. I'm also annoyed at this solution to the commanders. Again, the Fantastic Four lacked any sense of agency in solving these problems, and they basically just turn doom against them all and have them arrested anyways. So why not just do that to begin with? Reed and the Four could have just staged this act maybe, oh, earlier in the issue when the thing says that the military and S.H.I.E.L.D. are ready to jump as soon as someone twitches... They could have just ended that scene with Doom suggesting that they twitch. <gasps> they could have orchestrated the attack. Have Ben contact the Avengers, uh, and hell, he could have even acted it, saying that he heard word that Doom is up to something. Something's gonna go down today, so they best be ready. Then, Doom could have neutered the cannons on his ship, or something similar, uh, before giving Dorma the order to attack. Then, when she did attack, the Avengers would respond, Doom could turn on her, defeat her publicly and before the commanders, and then turn her over for safekeeping. He could have even played it like Dorma betrayed him. Ooh! He could even have approached her behind closed doors, suggesting that they attack now that the world has been lulled into a false confidence after the marriage. There are just so many more devious, more interesting ways that the Fantastic Four could have actively worked to solve this problem, that this solution just feels very phoned in. Given how intelligent Reed is supposed to be, it's frustrating that he takes such a backseat in dealing with this issue's problems. So this one didn't work as well as the previous two. It does look gorgeous, God, I love Salvador LaRocca's combat pages, even if I hate that they're all focused on the Avengers here. It is really easy to skim over the writing problems that this issue has, as everything that we're presented with does work, and it is just so pretty. But this is not the Fantastic Four at their most fantastic. This is the Fine Four, and I want better than that, especially with such a cool an idea as Reed Richards having to pretend to be Doctor Doom. I would also like to note that this issue of Fantastic Four features the announcement that Chris Claremont would be leaving the book, returning to the Uncanny X-Men and X-Men comics for his second run on them, the Revolution era of the X-Books, and he'll be taking Salvador LaRocca with him. The death bell is tolling on this run, so let's keep going. Issue 29, brought to us by Claremont, LaRocca, Fiber, and Liquid once again, opens with Sue Storm Richards Von Doom running through the desert. Narration indicates that she isn't running just for the sake of exercise, though. No, she's running because she's trying to escape her emotions. Something has hurt her, frightened her, some kind of unwelcome truth. What could that thing possibly be? Well, let's see. Not long ago, specifically an unspecified amount of days ago, Wilhelmina Lumpkin stops at Pier 4 to deliver the Fantastic Four's mail, but she's greeted by their greatest enemy instead, Dr. Doom. Willie hesitates to turn over the mail at first. After all, it is illegal to give mail to its non-intended recipient. But Doom did marry Sue and join the Fantastic Four, and the mail is addressed to the Fantastic Four, so he has rights to it now. Also, his general tone brooks no disobedience. As he heads inside, flipping through the mail, he contacts the rest of the team, asking them if they want breakfast. Ben, however, is busy updating their pogo plane with new stealth modules. Since the government has revoked pretty much all of their flight permits, they're going to need to be extra sneaky while they save the world now. Johnny is just returning home from a night on the town with Namor Rita, who is Namor's cousin, if you couldn't guess. So, Reed makes some coffee and cinnamon toast for himself, 
but is shocked when they are swiped right out of his hands. The invisible woman says that she appreciates the meal, though. Strangely, though, Reed isn't having it. This kind of childish behavior is unbecoming of the Baroness Von Doom. He orders Sue to show herself. Sue does, but as she reappears, whew, if looks could kill. Reed immediately says that he was just joking, but Sue is in no mood for jokes. She has appointments to negotiate their continued life in this warehouse home of theirs, and she needs to keep herself out of jail over her husband's and son's disappearance. Today is a very serious day, Reed. Reed apologizes and stands, moving to hug his wife, but she blocks him with a force field. Outraged, Reed pushes a button on his gauntlet, and Sue's force field is destabilized and it vanishes. This time, Sue is the one outraged. How dare he violate her sense of self? But Johnny dashes through the room, interrupting as he grabs both the coffee and the toast. This gives Sue a chance to turn invisible, and she leaves. Spotting the mail, Johnny picks it up and leaves through it. Hey, his old college roommate Wyatt Wingfoot sent him a CD-ROM game module! Sweet! <laughs> a CD-ROM-based computer game. Wow, I forgot those were a thing. I know that this comic is 21 years old now, but... Ah, uh, damn. That's weird. So this opening with Sue is nicely done. I like how quiet it is, how character-focused it is. Claremont does have narration running through the whole time, but it's all about Sue's feelings and her thoughts. At first, it just looks like she's out for some exercise, which we've seen Sue do before, back in issue 6. But she is in costume here, although she does have a sweatband on. But the longer that she runs, the more the narration focuses on her state of mind. This is physical exertion so that she can block out some painful thoughts, and then we go into the flashback for the rest of the issue, exploring what those thoughts could be. And right off the bat, we have some unpleasant behavior from Reed. It's nothing terribly egregious, but still, it is some hurtful and rude behaviors. I could see the demand that she show herself as an ill-thought-out joke, but him deactivating her force field is honestly a real creeper move here. Sue's force fields act as an extension of her will, so if she was annoyed or nervous enough to want to keep her husband away from her, that's her choice, and he should respect that. And remember, Sue only thinks that this man is her husband. There has been no hard physical proof to prove that idea otherwise yet. This is a nonverbal no from Sue. She doesn't want him to touch her, so it is particularly weird that Reed, who is at least sensitive to his wife's feelings, if kind of inconsiderate, pushes it this far. Is that enough to send Sue running, though? I'm not sure, but it is definitely a bad move on Reed's part. To that point, Reed comments that he's sorry for probably scaring Willie, which he only says to himself, not to Willie, actually, and he uses the excuse that he is so used to being Doom now that he just forgets it around everyday people. But that's an idea that I don't really buy either. Reed would only need to be Doom to people who know Dr. Doom, and those were pretty much just the commanders, and they're gone now. The Fantastic Four haven't appeared in any other comics or plot lines that I can find, which would force Reed to reinforce Doom-like behavior. And when he's with his family, Reed should just be himself, right? Why the continued holdover? Combine that with the scene with Sue, and Reed is acting really strange in this issue. And then we have Johnny and Namorita going out again. This is a new development for sure. Most of Claremont's use of Johnny has just been as the hothead of the group, demanding action while the cooler heads pay attention to what's going on or formulate a plan to save the day. Or, to be fair, he has been paired with Caldonia. I've gone back and forth on whether or not Johnny is actually attracted to Caldonia or if they're just friends, and this would seem to indicate that they are just friends. To be fair, Johnny did protest every time that someone hinted that the two were a couple, so perhaps I was just reading more into those moments. After all, as soon as Caledonia is gone and life returns to some semblance of normal, Johnny's back with Nita. Huh. 
I am oddly disappointed by that. Not too much later, a Fantastiflare floats in the sky above Pier 4. The team gathers in Johnny's room, where he reveals that Wyatt Wingfoot's family and tribe, the Kiwazi, are being held hostage by the Frightful Four, and they need their help. Sue was like, okay, let's get into costume and hope that Ben's stealth modules are as good as he says they are. Hey, come on, Susie! But Reed harumphs. He is the team's leader. He should be the one giving direction. And Sue was like, what? This isn't an official body. There's no structured hierarchy in the Fantastic Four. What's wrong with her plan anyway? And Reed explains that there's nothing wrong with it. It just, it should have come from Reed. What structure there is, is to prevent confusion and thus danger in the field, Susan. So listen to me. Sue turns away from him. Okay. It, uh, it won't happen again. Reed! What are you doing, man? Sue is not only your wife, she's also a seasoned adventurer and she has legitimately led the Fantastic Four before. She has every right to give direction. But, to be fair, the Fantastic Four have argued this point before. Back during the Fantastic Four's first encounter with the Ruined, way back in issue one, Sue gave orders and Reed was thrown by it. Maybe this is his hurt feelings over breakfast picking at an old wound? Still, it feels like a real jerk move. In fact, it kind of feels like something that Dr. Doom would say. The Frightful Four are an old enemy team, debuting way back in March of 1965 in Fantastic Four Volume 1, Issue 36. Their lineup has changed over the years, but they are often led by the Wizard, a.k.a. Bentley Whitman. Whitman is a genius, and used his scientific acumen to create devices so that he could perform magical stunts as a stage performer and escape artist. Hence, his legal name change to the Wizard. He has fought the Fantastic Four both alone and with allies before, uh, usually numbering in the amount of three, hence the Frightful Four, but he has lost every time. His specific gimmick is that he dresses in purple and pink armor, usually with a too large headpiece just to show off how smart he is, and that he uses anti-gravity discs. These can be used on his feet, allowing him to fly, or they can be attached to other people or objects, shooting them up into the sky like a rocket. This particular time, the wizard has allied himself with the Trapster, the original Punisher, what the floop is the original Punisher? And She-Thing. We've seen the Trapster before, back in Fantastic Four Volume 3, Issue 10, or Episode 12.5 of this very podcast, where he trapped the genius Liss Reed Richards for Genosha. He uses various paste-like substances to trap his enemies, and that's about it. That's his thing. He's a white guy, brown hair, he has like a dark purple jacket, and a, a big backpack on that has all of his paste, which he shoots out of tubes that are connected to his gloves. He's silly. I like him. The original Punisher that is mentioned is an alien android. These things were used by Galactus, and one defended his world ship from the Fantastic Four back in Volume 1, Issue 49. This guy is some classic Jack Kirby weirdness, with thick four-toed feet, green legs, and purple body armor covering the rest of its upper body. I have never heard of this particular character before, so this was honestly all new to me. The only reason I know any of this is because of research. Thank you, Internet. Although, it does make Amalgam Comics' Challengers of the Fantastic make more sense to me. That's one of the things that I love about comic books. That a book in 2001 can reference a character from 1966 that makes me realize something about another character in a comic book published in 1997. That's why I like back issues so much and the hunting and putting together of things. I love the fact that all of this stuff can count and can reference itself at any time. That's really cool to me. The final member of the Frightful Four is the She-Thing, and she is someone that we're going to get into later. She has the single biggest character role out of these four characters, so I don't want to ruin it here. Just hold on tight, folks. So we travel to Silver Rock Springs, a town that looks exactly like a picture of an impoverished indigenous people's town. Except that it isn't. 
That's just what the Kiwazi want you to think. You see, when oil was discovered in their lands, they became rich, and then they used that money to educate their children on the developing technology of the world. The Kiwazi now own a tech development company that rivals the best out of Silicon Valley, and no one knows it. They just see some poor indigenous people and move on. That is how Wyatt Wingfoot was able to sneak out a message through a computer game, by the way, and warn the Fantastic Four of their situation. Inside one of the buildings, Wyatt and his sister, Winona, have been pasted to a wall and the wizard is busy questioning them. He wants their hidden treasure, but Wyatt insists that they have no treasure. The wizard assures him that he knows otherwise. He intercepted Wyatt's message to the Fantastic Four in the Avengers back in issue 26, and he has heard the legends of Tomazuma protecting the Kiwazi. If there is something here to protect, then he wants it. Unknown to the wizard, the invisible woman sneaks up next to Winona. She appears to be fixing something to the woman, but it isn't clear what it is or what purpose it serves, nor do we honestly ever get an explanation for it. Winona doesn't seem to notice it either, and she just tells the wizard off. The Kiwazi never surrendered to the United States Army. Why would they surrender to a dweeb like him? The wizard congratulates her as he affixes an anti-gravity disc to her chest. She's about to become the first Native American in space. Then she shoots upward. The wizard turns to Wyatt. Who else will join her before they give him what he wants? Wyatt says that they can't give him anything because there's nothing to give. The stories are just that. They're stories, man. Across the room, the trapster questions how far the wizard plans on taking this. He signed on for a smash and grab, sure, but killing people takes things to a whole nother level. He reports that the device that he stands at shows that the girl is falling. She must have removed her disc. But that means that she's going to die from the fall, and this whole adventure goes from being a robbery to a murder. And that concerns him. This is where the Fantastic Four strike. The Invisible Woman moves first, confronting the Trapster. The Thing joins her, only to be fought off by the original Punisher. The Thing is surprised to see it. After all, it was working for Galactus the last time that he saw it, and that was 40 years ago. The Wizard explains that he found the Punisher at some point over the years, and, with his incredible mind, he reprogrammed it to obey only him. The Human Torch teams up with the Thing on it, recognizing it as the largest threat there is. This leaves the Invisible Woman to handle the Wizard, who activates his special device. Suddenly, the powers of the Fantastic Four just stop. Johnny drops to the ground as his flames go out. The Thing is immobilized as his body turns into just stone. Sue can no longer breathe through her force fields, which she is using to protect Wyatt from the Wizard. Plus, he explains, if she turns invisible, light will no longer reach her eyes, rendering her blind. Best of all, thanks to his device, Mr. Fantastic's heart will no longer be able to pump blood through all of his extended limbs and their outlandish shapes, and he'll die. Where, uh, where is Mr. Fantastic, by the way? Sue smiles. How in the world did he miss the news? Her husband is gone. In fact, he should meet her new husband. That's when Doctor Doom bursts into the room, declaring that anyone who attacks Susan has also attacked Doom. And there's energy crackling from his hands, and he's floating off of the floor. All of that good stuff. Great entrance. You look good, Doom. You look good. Behind him is Winona, rescued from her fall, hence Doom's delayed entrance compared to the rest of the team. Even further behind Doom is She-Thing, and she isn't impressed by his entrance at all. Using her immense strength, She-Thing smashes an enormous slab of stone over Doom. He ruined her life. Now, she gets to return the favor. So hold the phone. Now that She-Thing has actually entered the story, let's talk about her for a second. First off, how about a physical description? She-Thing is a large, muscular woman. Uh, she looks very Hulk-like, and I don't mean she-Hulk-like, but Hulk-like, although she still has Caucasian skin tones. She's not green. Her face is very wide, with a flat nose and a wide jaw. She looks very caveman-like, actually. 
Strawberry blonde hair hangs in her face, uncared for. She's dressed in a red top with sleeves, but the bottom is cut like a bathing suit showing off her legs. A yellow streak shaped like an M runs over her chest, bisecting the top. Blue gloves that are edged with yellow along the base cover her hands, and she has a matching set of thigh-high boots covering her legs. She also has on a blue domino mask that hides her eyes. She... she is not pretty. But she once was. Sharon Ventura met the thing back in the 80s, when he was an active part of the Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation, a wrestling group for superpowered people. Inspired by him, she got super strength from some bad guys, joined the UCWF, and became Miss Marvel, wearing the costume that I just described, but back when she was much more slim. She eventually quit wrestling, dated the thing, and joined the Fantastic Four. While out on an adventure, she got hit with cosmic rays and mutated into a form similar to the thing. But, you know, female. In the comics, she kept the name Miss Marvel, but fans gave her the unfortunate name of She-Thing, and it just stuck. Eventually, Ben was turned back into human for a time, but Doctor Doom offered Sharon a solution to being a rock monster. He could transfer the cosmic rays from her into another person, and Ben agreed, transforming back into the Thing, allowing Sharon to be human again. Eventually, Sharon quit the Fantastic Four and actually joined up with Doctor Doom on the promise that he could do what Reed Richards never could, find a permanent cure for Ben Grimm's condition. But when she refused to betray the Fantastic Four to him, Doom mutated her further into the form that we now see. So this isn't just some thug like the Punisher or the Trapster. For Sharon, this is personal. And now the wizard is like, dude, what the fu- No swearing. He had planned to confront the Fantastic Four. Sure, he could have beaten those fools. But this is Dr. Floopa Doom! He's gonna kill us all! Stand down, she thinks, stand down! But she thinks scoffs. Uh, they just beat the Fantastic Four, and the Fantastic Four happened to beat Dr. Doom all of the time. So, by the transitive properties of butt kicks, the Frightful Four should be able to butt kick Dr. Doom. Dr. Doom arises from the rubble of the stone that she thing hit him with. It isn't going to be that easy, Miss Ventura, although Doom will give them one chance to surrender. The Frightful Four don't take it. Doom ends up revealing to the Human Torch that they never lost their powers at all. Rather, the wizard's illusions and technology just made them think that they did. So, now it is four on four. The Invisible Woman uses invisible tubes to pipe the Trapster's paste into the body of the Punisher, gumming up its work so that it can no longer function, and that stops that. This also drains the Trapster of his one tool, so he's pretty much out of the fight. The Thing battles She-Thing, trying to reason with her and calm her down, but she is tired of empty promises and people failing her. As they battle, Winona and Doctor Doom free the captured Kiwazi people, corner the wizard, and force him to surrender. Ranting about wanting all of this to end and having only hate left to her, she thinks says that there is only way to end this fight, and it's over her dead body. But Wyatt dashes between her and Ben. He won't believe that death and hate are the only ways to win today. Sharon was once part of the Fantastic Four, and this isn't what they do. She isn't a monster. She isn't a murderer. She is a hero. Even if she's forgotten that, Sharon raises a fist above her head, preparing to crush the small human in front of her. But he stands proudly. The Kiwazi protect their friends, and that includes the Fantastic Four. If she wants to kill them, then she'll have to kill him first. After a pause... Sharon drops to her knees. Wyatt moves in and hugs her. A short time after, as the authorities arrest the wizard and trapster, Sue commends Wyatt for his bravery. He replies that the Kiwazi have offered Sharon a place among them. Maybe here she can accept who she is and figure out who she'll be moving forward. Everyone goes astray once in a while, even the best of us. That night, the Fantastic Four bunk at Silver Rock Springs, enjoying the hospitality of their friends. Sue wakes up in the middle of the night, and, of course, her husband isn't next to her. 
She can hear him in the next room, typing on a laptop, still trying to get access to the Fantastic Four's computer systems. She sighs sympathetically. The systems still read him as Doctor Doom, and it has clearly been frustrating him. Turning invisible so as not to disturb him, Sue peeks into the room. Sitting next to the laptop is Doom's face mask. The laptop chirps as he finishes typing. Access granted. Sue's eyes go wide. Reed instructs the computer to change its system access rules. Victor Von Doom shall now have complete access to the systems. In fact, he'll have equal or greater access than the rest of the Fantastic Four. Once the computer finishes updating that, he adds that it will wipe all memory logs of this change. Then it should reboot. He stands and puts the mask of Doctor Doom back on. That is when Sue decided to start running. With equal access to their computer systems, Doom can now know every bit of history about them. Plus, access to the computers also gives him access to the data from their costumes. So now he will know their every physical trait and whereabout. There is no hiding from him now. And sure enough, Ben, Johnny, and Doom catch up to her. She trips, falling to the ground, and Reed offers her his hand. Is she all right? Nervousness and fear drive Sue's heart like a jackhammer. Ordinarily, this would give her away, but now Reed will expect an increased heart rate thanks to the run. She's going to have to convince Reed in every way that nothing is wrong when she knows for a fact that something is. Sue takes his hand and stands. She's fine. Just wanted to stretch her legs. Doom nods at this. Very well. Let's go home, then. And the next issue box promises that home to be the Eastern European nation of Latveria. Victor Von Doom's homeland. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what makes this streak of issues worth it. If you didn't get chills... When I described that scene of Sue discovering that Reed was free, but chose to keep pretending to be Doom? Well, then I probably did a really bad job of selling it, because that scene is amazing! Up to this issue, Reed has been forced to play the role of Doom because of outside forces. We've discussed this. It was those darn commanders. But the commanders are gone now, and so yeah, Reed is still trapped in the armor, but that only matters when he's in public, in private with his family, the armor is just an inconvenience. Even more importantly, there was no real question about whether or not Reed would be able to unlock that armor someday, it was just a matter of time. We all thought that we knew where this story train was going, and Claremont just blew up the train tracks. Admittedly, we don't know anything about Reed's motivations or what is driving him to keep up the charade for now. But the fact that he is hiding it from his family is the thing that really matters here, and it's what makes this scene so chilling. This isn't, Reed cracked the armor, but I need to pretend to be Doom as part of a larger goal to keep the world safe, and then he lays that out to his family, and it's weird, but it's kind of okay. This is Reed cracked the armor and kept it to himself. Why? To what end? Obviously, the rest of the story is going to explore that idea, and it is a great way to end this issue. This scene is actually why I think She-Hulk was involved in this issue at all. I mean, she was probably involved because Claremont likes to acknowledge old history points and unfinished storylines, even if he doesn't care to actually resolve them. Note that here he introduces She-Thing's story and her problems, but he also does nothing to solve them, he just abandons her to the Kiwazi. But there is also some good foreshadowing here. Claremont had Wyatt tell Sue that everyone goes astray from time to time, even the best of us. And then here at the end, we have Reed Richards going astray. Claremont was introducing the idea that sometimes people do bad things or make mistakes, and we need to help them move past those bad things and become better people, not just kill them or let them die. That said, this version of the Frightful Four is kind of unimpressive, nor are they very interesting. I like that the wizard intercepted the transmission that Wyatt sent a couple issues ago. That's a cool way of getting him to the Kiwazi lands and make him think that there's something there worth his attention. 
And while I do like the idea of the wizard defeating the Fantastic Four by fooling them, just basically outthinking them in general, I also don't really understand how he was able to do that. We're told by Doom that it was all basically tricks and illusions, but... But how were those reactions tricks or illusions? Johnny's flames shut off. Ben could not move. Sue was struggling to breathe. These are physical reactions to something. There were no devices placed on them. There were no mind control tricks or hypnotism to mess with their minds here. The wizard pressed a button on his suit, and they were all affected differently by one thing. And sure, I guess that fits the wizard's shtick. I mean, a good magician never reveals his secrets after all, but it just feels like an easy way to explain wildly differing effects on three separate superhumans coming from one localized source. This is a hand wave. It might as well literally just be bamfing magic, it's so non-explained. I have to admit that I do appreciate the wizard surrendering when finally confronted by Doctor Doom. He's smart enough to realize when he's beaten, at least. The Punisher and Trapster are here to be beatable thugs. They're challenging, but they're not really characters in their own right for this particular issue. The Trapster did defeat Reed Richards last time when he encountered him, so you would think that he would be kind of confident going up against someone like Doctor Doom. But again, he doesn't really get a chance to do anything, as Sue drains his paste, so I feel like that's a bit of a wasted opportunity. I kind of think that this whole issue would have been more interesting if the wizard was acting alone. He clearly knew that the Fantastic Four were going to show up, or that they could show up, at least. So perhaps he could have teamed up with the Trapster uh, to do just that, set up traps for the Fantastic Four. He could have hidden himself with Wyatt deep under the property lands of the Kiwazi, and with each trap or technological device that the Fantastic Four encounter, another one of them would have been taken down, until only Doom was left the variable uncounted for. I'm not saying that would have been a better issue, but I kind of like the basic idea. I also don't buy that the wizard didn't hear about Doctor Doom marrying into the Fantastic Four. We got an entire issue about how big the wedding was to the entire world and the media, and we're just going to pretend that the wizard didn't see any kind of news reports? Like, this is a guy whose hobby is trying to kill the Fantastic Four. You would think that he would keep better tabs on them. I like this issue a lot more than the previous one, at least. Obviously, the ending goes a long way to increasing my overall opinion, but I do like the framing of Sue running from something. It's clever, and it's in character, and it does wrap around quite nicely. I like the strange developments with Reed, as they are super interesting and intriguing, again, Claremont knows how to get me to buy another comic book. And while the middle portion with the wizard is kind of lacking overall, it's not a bad adventure in general. It plays with Fantastic Four history well, and it foreshadows our story elements that Sue and Reed will be exploring in the next few issues. So that's pretty nicely done. That's a nice way to kind of save the wizard area of it. And of course, the Roca, Thyber, and Liquid kill it with the artwork. This is the 26th issue of their collaborative run, and they are so far interrupted and just looking better with each issue. How do they do it? Next week is an interesting week. Sue Storm Richards is the only member of the Fantastic Four to know that Reed Richards is hiding something. And who knows what'll happen if she slips up. To make matters worse, Sue begins to have strange dreams where she is communicating with the real Doctor Doom in order to stop her husband. What has that man been up to? Well, we'll catch up with Victor Von Doom, too, when I break down not only Fantastic Four issue 30, but Doom issue 1 as well, in Comic Book Breakdown episode 12.24, Fantastic Four volume 3, Trading Places. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening.